morbidity, and mortality. It is a tremendous honor to be here today, along with our fellow Black Mama Matter Alliance Steering Committee members. Where you at? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and with the support of the Congressional Black Caucus. Anybody from the caucus here? Yeah. And the Black Caucus of Black Women and Girls. We are we are working with Black Women Girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, important. Okay. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to discuss this important issue with you, our esteemed representatives, policymakers, and community of concern colleagues. The speakers that you will hear from today are experts on issues of black and brown health, and they represent a diversity of professional background. Drawing on their specific areas of expertise, our speakers will collectively outline some of the challenges and opportunities for utilizing the human rights framework to improve black maternal health in the United States. Our presentation will begin with Dr. Peter Jackson, yes, That's okay. who will discuss the importance of focusing on black mothers as well as babies. Dr. Jackson is university affiliated at Columbia University and most recently was visiting scholar in the psychology department at Southern College. She is also founder of Save 100 Babies, a cross-sectoral network devoted to a social determinist approach to reducing black infant mortality. Following Dr. Jackson will be Dr. Haywood Brown, Dr. who will cover the OBGYN perspective on black maternal health. Dr. Brown is president of the American Conference of OBGYN and is a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Duke, where he served as chair of the department for 14 years. He has, he has chosen maternal health as a focus area for his tenure as president of the American Congress of Puerto Rican Language. Woohoo! Yay! Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And finally, Cherise Scott will outline her work in Tennessee addressing the political climate of her state and some of the maternal health sister reach her organization is doing in Tennessee on reproductive justice, um, a group, uh, only reproductive justice organization. This work includes working on the fetal assault law, which led to victory in the feeding House Bill 1660, which criminalized mothers struggling with drug addiction during the 2016 legislative session. Sharice is founder and CEO of Sister Reach, an organization that works from a four-pronged strategy of education, policy, voter education, and culture change work. We hope that the information provided during this presentation will assist you in identifying resources, analyzing legislation, and seeking out promising solutions. Before we hear from these speakers, I want to take a moment to provide you with some background information to explain why we do this work and why we believe the preventable maternal deaths of the U black women in the U.S. is a matter of human rights. As you may be aware, the United States is the only developed country in the world where maternal mortality is on the rise. Black women in the U.S. die at three to four times the rate of white women, and black women in the southern U.S. are acutely at risk. As a black woman from the deep south who is an obstetrician and a mother, my deep desire to end this inequity is amplified every time I look into the faces of my daughter and mother. Despite clear evidence of maternal health inequities, our government and policymakers have yet to address maternal mortality and morbidity as an urgent public health and human rights issue. For some, weeks, for some of us, persistent racial disparities in maternal health, health or another reminder that race continues to shape one's life chances in the U.S. Our wealth as a nation was built upon belief of a racial hierarchy. This belief of human value can be, can be graded by the color of our skin was embedded in our government, in our scientific, and our civil society since the early founding of our young history of our nation. From abolishing slavery, ending Jim Crow, the civil rights era, and now our current Black Lives Matter movement, we have made steady but slow progress dismantling the devaluation of black women. And although poverty is a relevant issue that closely ties to race in the United States, race still matters. As a black mother, I cannot buy or educate my way out of dying at three, four times the rate of white women in the United States. Higher rates of maternal mortality persist among black women. I'm getting old, my eyes are. Um, regardless of, as Dominique Coates describes, as a result of 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, and 35 years of racist housing policy. Maternal mortality also extends beyond the period of pregnancy or birth. Nine months of prenatal care cannot count in that reason in the underlying social determinants of health, such as housing, political participation, 
education, food, environmental conditions, and economic security. All of which, all of which, have racism as their root cause. Maternal health outcomes also influence our health policies that either support or deny reproductive rights. Many state governments, especially in the South, are resistant to sexual and reproductive rights or even state support for basic health care services. This recalcitrance impedes a Southern woman's access to the information, facilities, services, and resources they need to plan and have healthy pregnancies. Good maternal health outcomes depend upon implementation of all sexual and reproductive rights, from a comprehensive self-education, health education to access to birth control. However, many women in the U.S. find that the safety net is too thin, and that state and federal policies fail to support their health and well-being. For example, some U.S. families qualify for public health insurance in Medicaid and North Carolina, but the income where qualifications vary by state, Medicaid expansion is not everywhere, to many, to too many working poor and left uninsured. Even if women are insured, coverage for sexual and reproductive health services is not comprehensive. There is a strong political resistance to sexual reproductive health services in the South and elsewhere. Consequently, there are many legal barriers to service information. The lack of a safety net for poor women produces gaps in access to a long reproductive life course, from accessing contraception to planned healthy pregnancies to postpartum care that helps manage infections and identify risk factors for mortality. Continuing to care for women after the delivery of a baby is especially important because many maternal deaths occur during the first year of Our health care system can and must include the quality, access, and sometimes the service lives, but we must also be clear that maternal health is not just about clinical work. Maternal health will improve from black girls to women rights are realized. Some of you might be wondering why would a human rights based approach to maternal health matter in the United States? a country that spends more per capita on health care than any other developed nation. As a black woman in the U.S., it is becoming increasingly clear to me that we need the ability to compare the U.S. with other countries to see opportunities to improve, as well as our ideas of how to do that. The human rights framework provides a roadmap to solutions. A human rights approach is also needed in the U.S. because biomedical solutions are not, are not alone. The U.S. has one of the most sophisticated, technologically advanced healthcare systems in the world, but we still have inequities. Black women are still suffering from preventable maternal death, which is a direct reflection of the devaluation of black women and black women in the U.S. The human rights framework is us to address structural racism and helps keep U.S. law possible to understand how many forms of discrimination, in this case, gender plus race, plus socioeconomic status intersect to impact black women differently. As our speakers today will illustrate, black women in the U.S. encounter numerous obstacles to maternal health, including access and discrimination in health care, housing, education, and criminal justice. However, a human rights approach allows us to uncover solutions by putting the women who are most affected, um, by putting the women who are most affected at the table in the decision-making um, position. And human rights approach also looks beyond public health and maternal health to address social determinants of health and underlying causes of health and As a member of the Black Moms of Matter Alliance, we utilize human rights and later reproductive justice framework in our efforts to reframe the conversation on black maternal health and improve maternal health outcomes. We are a woman-led, a black woman-led, cross-sectoral alliance with a mission to censor black women in order to advocate, drive research, build power, and shift culture for black women's maternal health rights and justice. We envision a world where black mamas have the rights, respects, and resources to thrive before, during, and after pregnancy, not just survive. We leverage the talent and knowledge that exists already in our black communities, and we have brought some of that talent into this room today. And we hope to be a resource for all of you in the future. On behalf of the Black Women's Matter Alliance, I want to thank you all for being here. Black women in the U.S. need government accountability. We need to know that our lives are valued. This accountability may be complicated, but if the government still has an obligation to act, it is a human rights imperative. Fortunately, there are a number of immediate opportunities for Congress to take steps to improve Black maternal health. First, we need to improve data collection and 
monitoring the procurement bills. And there are currently bills that will be discussed in the House and the Senate that aim to, pre to prevent maternal death just by improving monitoring processes. The U.S. is slowly making pro progress through implementation of state-level maternal death review mechanisms that consistent level of recommendations that this bill will support. However, to truly to have true equity and improvement, we need to push further and, and examine the role of racism and non-biomedical factors. And one day, we will recognize that black is the risk factor for racism is. Thank you. So, we have Yes, thank you. To the uh, leadership of the Black Maternal, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, to uh, our distinguished panelists, and to everyone in attendance, a pleasant good afternoon. And thank you for having me here today. I want to first start by acknowledging my colleagues, Representative Robin Kelly of Illinois and Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey, who co-founded co with me the Congressional Caucus for black women and girls, which is the first congressional caucus ever established to craft policy that address the needs and concerns of black women and girls and celebrate their accomplishments against the odds and the obstacles that we've had to overcome. I'd like to thank uh, today's panelists, moderate, moderator, uh, Dr. Joy Creer Perry, Dr. Fleeta Mask Jackson, Dr. Haywood Brown, and Ms. Shreese Scott. <clears throat> At la and last but not least, I want to give a heartfelt thanks to the Black Mamas Matter Alliance for their briefing and for all of the great work they do in advancing the human right to safe and respectful maternal care. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Black women are three times more likely to die from complications of pregnancy or childbirth than their white female counterparts. That's about 42 black women that die per 100,000 live births, as opposed to just 12 deaths per 100,000 live births for white women. Maternal death results from a multitude of conditions such as hemorrhaging, hypertensive disease, and embolic, embolic uh, disease, which is one of the main causes of death in black mothers. Although most conditions which claim the lives of black mothers can be prevented, not enough awareness or medical and emotional support are given to our women. Having equal access to quality care can be the difference between a healthy childbirth and a very devastating loss. But there's another component that is critical to having a healthy pregnancy and childbirth, and that's stress. And I'm under a lot of it. <laughs> Let's face it, being black in America is in and it of itself stressful, regardless of your socioeconomic background, couple that with the physical stress of pregnancy on one's body. However, I believe that ensuring equal access to quality care can be accomplished by strengthening the Affordable Care Act and continuing to encourage states to expand their Medicaid coverage. And, uh, just so that everyone in this room is aware, the Senate is in the midst of some hocus pocus right now. <laughs> We need to stay woke. That's right. That's right. That's right. We need to raise our voices, send out those emails, those text messages, and keep the pressure on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't let this time lapse where they believe that uh, we've all gone back to sleep because something really dreadful is about to go down. And we need to stand in the gap for all these mothers who need uh, a robust health care infrastructure. Yes. Yes. I also believe that the only way to effectively manage the stress of being black in America is to stand up and fight back against the systemic institutional racism of our country, which for years has limited black women's access to a living wage, an equal pay for equal work, safe and affordable housing, 
nutritious food, and many other resources needed to live in dignity and have a healthy pregnancy. So let's join as we raise our voices and work in opposition to the policies that continue to restrict the success of black mothers so that we can ensure that no woman dies giving birth. I want to thank all of you. This is a packed room uh, this, this afternoon, and it's good to see that so many of you have come out to be informed, to be engaged, to be connected in what is really a, a battle for our generation. These are issues that we need not revisit in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. yes. We need to be the generation that says enough and make sure that every woman's life, in particular black women who've been marginalized throughout history, are given the dignity, the support, that it needs to thrive, that we need to thrive, because indeed that is strengthening the health and well-being of our nation. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Really, it is just heartwarming to see this crowd that's here. We didn't know what was going to happen. Again, I thank you for being here. As I said, my name is Fleeta Mass Jackson and I'm a research and advocate living in Atlanta, Georgia. For nearly 20 years, my work has been involved in investigations designed to uncover the causes of the disproportionate high rates of black infant deaths and premature and low birth weight being born to African American women. When I began the work, the disparities for black and white women was as high as five to one in some places. While we've seen significant declines overall in the rate of infant mortality in this country, Including declines among African American women, the disparities between the losses of infant to black women as compared to white women is still two to one, much too high, and is that case regardless of socioeconomic income. Black babies are twice as likely to be to be born too soon and too little. In my first, in my quest, my quest for explanations has been conducted in partnership with communities of African American women who lent their authoritative voices on the, in their, on their lives as the directive for uncovering risks and remedies for their health, particularly during pregnancy and childbirth. What black women have shared across generations is the stress and strain of being black and female, connecting those daily assaults as significant risk to their health and the health and well-being of themselves and their children, children the risk that is apparent even as they carry those children in their womb. Now, as researchers, providers, and advocates continue their quest for explanation and remedies for despair, disparately high black birth and black infant deaths, we are confronted with the equally shocking news of the rise in U.S. maternal mortality. With other countries have seen a decline in deaths related to pregnancy complications, ours have seen a precipitous increase, as is the case for infant mortality, and as the case for infant mortality. The situation is deplorable. Black women are three times more likely to die as a consequence of black com of birth complications, and some places it's 12 times more likely. Mm -hmm. The rise in maternal mortality is back, and as medical protocols to respond to deadly emergencies are being explored or advanced, attention is also being given to the causes for maternal morbidity, which can compromise future health outcomes and place pregnant women in mortal danger. My work on poor birth outcomes is not just focused on babies, and it's not just focused on women. It involves inextricably links between the health of the mother and the health of the infant. But without question, both lives begin with the health and the well-being of the mother. It's not an either-or proposition. It's an and and both uh, uh, process. So my work, my clear into the risk of poor health of mothers and babies is centered on emotional and mental health, particularly as it pertains to the lived experience of African American women. So today, I set my focus on its potential impact on maternal mortality, uh, based, based extensive work, and based extensive work based on looking at the role of gendered racism. Scientists generally document the ill effects of constant cumulative stress, which produces physiological and emotional responses. Studies have shown that stress is a significant contributor 
to heart disease, hypertension, and gastrointestinal condition. Hormone response to unabated stress can lead to suppressed immune function, consequential to infection and diseases. In the cases of stress as well as impregnants and birth outcomes, there are indications of its indication of its connection to poor birth outcomes. The suppression of immune functions can lead to infections that trigger treatment for birth, increase cortisol levels because of prolonged stress, and create change in the inter interutral environment that restrict growth and lead to low birth weight. Everyone experiences stress, whether it's from day-to-day -day challenges, major life changes and events, or catastrophic episodes. Whatever the case might be, the context of those experiences is informed by who we are individually and collectively. For black women, race and gender matter as the basis of stress has contributed to disparate reproductive outcomes. My work is guided by the construct of intersectionality, where the intersection of multiple identities and forms of discrimination are not merely additive, but rather multiplicative, meaning they're experienced and interpreted at multiple levels within the context of African American women's lives. Reflecting the construct of intersectionality, gender racism is the overlay of racial oppression onto the gender growth of assumed and imposed upon African American women. My work over the years has sought to uncover the unique stresses for African American women contributes to risk for poor reproductive outcomes. What African American women have shared about their lived experience has been translated into a measurement of the stress of gender racism. And from this work, we have, we have found that the stress that African American women experience uh, comes from multiple resources. The, dis um, the, the deleterious consequence of racism and the attitude on birth outcomes are well documented. In a study by Dominguez Parker, the results show a significant relationship between exposure to discrimination and decreasing birth high birth weights in African American babies. There's a growing body of research pointing to the number of stressful life events among African American women in comparison to women from other racial groups. In my own research of the stress of gender racism, we have had uncovered how it specifically affects the mental and emotional health of pregnant women. We found that as, 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 as the contextualized stress increased, so does the prevalence of depression. Uh, recently, we conducted research where we looked at the impact of police violence on African American pregnancies. In our latest research, we uncovered how African American, African -American pregnant women are, being, are, are related to the barrage of police violence directed toward black youths and adults, as seen in the media. In our study, we asked women about the prospect of police violence support African American youth and, and assessed depression. The results showed there was a highly significant association between the prospect of police violence support youth and depressive symptoms in pregnant African American women. Since depression is indicated as a powerful contributor to maternal mortality and stress most certainly is a factor in hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity and other risks for maternal mortality, early attention must be given care for those psychosocial indicators. We must advance policies and practices that are designed to arrest the rising incidence of maternal mortality. Protocol based on research, testing, and evaluation has to be established accompanied by the training of providers and information to patients. Most importantly, the information, the implementation of both protocols must be employed equitably across all populations. As we look to prevention and intervention for maternal mortality, and especially for African American women who carry the burden of this devastating outcome, building upon the recommendations from the Black Mama's Matter Toolkit, I would like to offer the following. We must advance quality improvement and prenatal, prenatal uh, maternal care so that it fully integrates emotional and mental health and a man that is responsive to the unique stress and trauma experienced by African American women. Yes. We must continue to support, uh, to support and expand the scope of programs that have successfully reduced the rates of immortality through comprehensive, integrated services for women, most at, at risk, mostly at risk of birth, birth outcomes, who are also likely 
are vulnerable to adverse maternal outcomes as well. And so I'm thinking of Healthy Start and some of those programs that have existed and have done a great job. Mm -hmm. Support community-based programs that serve women most vulnerable to maternal morbidity and mortality as promising practices with the potential for producing evidence-based approaches. That's very important because there are communities who are doing excellent work, but they never move to the point of uh, being recognized as evidence-based programs so that they can receive the, the resources they need to carry out the work that they do. Cultivating support for diverse community researchers and evaluates to be included in the investigations for determining the causes and interventions for maternal morbidity and mortality. And finally, continue the focus on the social determinants with the knowledge of the experience that women are um, embodied, the, with the knowledge of the experiences that women have for housing, unfair wages, uh, environmental degradation, uh, violence, that those embody the stressors that create the physiological and emotional reactions leading to poor maternal health outcomes. These are difficult days that we are in, but I am, but but I have I I am no ways tired because as I see people in the streets, in communities, young people, middle-aged people, older people, we must carry out the fight. Black lives, black babies, black mothers' lives matter. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank the uh, congressional leadership for the effort to be here today to help us be part of this major discussion on maternal mortality uh, in the United States, particularly the disparity of maternal mortality. I am the 68th president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I'm a practicing OBGYN in maternal fetal medicine suspects, and so I do this every day, but I want to start off with a story you heard statistics, because I can still see your face. A 17-year-old high school senior from a middle-class family, honor student, shows up in the emergency department having had a seizure at school. We're called down because she's had a stroke. She's had a stroke because she has blood pressures off the wall, and she had not had any care. We were able to save the baby, but not save her. A preventable maternal death, primarily because pregnancy may not have been accepted for in the home mm -hmm. or in the school, and her death could have been prevented by one prenatal visit. Yes. Because she didn't just become severely hypertensive the day she showed up. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. She was severely hypertensive for weeks. That's, right. That's the story. That's the tragedy of maternal death. High school senior, middle class family, influence, income, and insurance. There are many factors to maternal mortality that you have to think about. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistics today, but I love showing the slides. Maternal death is rare. Thank God, it's rare. These numbers don't look anything like they did in 1930, 1940, 1950, and death was much more common. The tragedy of maternal death is this, is this. The same slide that you all showed, the graphic description of it being four times higher in African-American women in this country than it is in many of the other countries. The other thing I will say to you is that maternal mortality from a study that we did in North Carolina is potentially preventable. Preventable because a visit to the doctor, a visit to a provider could pick up high blood pressure and preeclampsia. A visit to the doctor may tell you at risk of postpartum hemorrhage. A visit may tell you you have underlying heart disease risk. These are the type of things that we talk about that are real. But also, that visit has to be quality. Mm -hmm. Prenatal care is more than walking into the room, taking a blood pressure, dipping the urine, and saying, are you doing okay? You know? 
99.9% of people in here is caring. Mm -hmm. Caring enough for one of those teachers at that school knew that young lady was pregnant. I would say that almost all of her friends knew. Somebody knew. And so when we look at disparities, they are significant and they're dramatic. And I can talk about all of these things, but the comorbidities are indeed a risk. There's no question that being hypertensive going into a pregnancy changes your risk. Someone has to recognize that as being a factor, not only for preeclampsia, which is one of the leading causes of maternal death, from stroke. That's why we treat the blood pressure. Or heart failure, because the heart doesn't work right. And it's also increases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So anticipation of those things is part of the care process. Biases, no question. I've been doing this for 35 years in an academic setting, and I can tell you that institutional biases and individual biases that people bring into the system. Why? If I tell her to do something, she's probably not going to do it anyway. So why do I bother to counsel her on this? Assumptions don't work. I tell my trainees, you, train, you counsel everybody the same, regardless of what side of the track they live on. Now that she has Blue Cross Blue Shield, she's not at risk of that. Because <laughs> she doesn't have Medicaid. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Now that she's married to a physician, she's not going to get preeclampsia. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So every, for every maternal death, there are about 100 women who experience what we call a morbidity. And those morbidities are real. And we have to look at those things. It affects about 60,000 women annually in the United States and rates are rising. So we have something called the Alliance on Maternal Health, which is aimed, which is instrumental in uh, putting obstetric bundles uh, in every hospital. Every hospital in this country ought to have a bundle. And that's my focus at AMO. We also have to figure out and anticipate who's at risk. Part of that's related to disparity, but also these are the leading causes. These are pregnancy associated, pregnancy related deaths, hypertension, uh, hemorrhage mental health issues, and so forth. So we've got to consider the racial and ethnic disparities broadly. We acknowledge that they are very complex. We've got to focus on quality. We can talk about all the quality measures we want to. Quality, quality, quality. Quality, quality, quality. Modifiable risk factors. There are some. Patients hypertension, we've got to treat it. Patient's got uh, at risk for hemorrhage and she's anemic. We know it. We've got to treat it. Those are the things that we know. Important attributes of accountability, evidence based, feasibility, and actual care. So I want to tell you, finish off with a couple pieces. One of our asks on Capitol Hill this year was our maternal mortality review. These two bills will be circulating. We certainly want, I don't think anybody will vote against them, but I've been. Right. Okay. All right. Great. I would say, you know, this is very OBGYNs, nurses, social workers, and other health care professions that will review individual maternal deaths and recommend solutions to preventability from this tragic event. Every state should have one. 17 states have not even established their review. A lot of work to do. And these are the people we want to get to when, we, when these two bills come forward. So this is key. And these are the two bills that we have co-sponsorship on both sides. You know, maternal death is not a blue or red issue. Yes, sir. And so we hope that we'll get everybody's vote. But I'm not going <laughs> Authorize the CDC to assist states to create and expand maternal mortality review. Research disparities. The uh, bills are there for you to see. The Senate companion bill is 1112. These have already gotten bipartisan support, and the House bill is 1318.
So I want to thank you all. 99.9% of what we do is care. <coughs> Be here. I'm Sharice Scott, founder and CEO of Sister Peach, which is located in Memphis, Tennessee. And we've heard a lot today about this word, this term, reproductive justice. And so I just want to set a little context about what that is uh, a little bit more than what we've heard today. And so reproductive justice was a framework coined by black women in 1994 who did not see the systemic conditions contributing to poor health disparities among us reflected in not only mainstream feminism, but also uh, during the Clinton administration's health reform agenda. And so reproductive justice means that every woman has the human right to decide if and when she will have a baby and the conditions of under which she will give birth, decide if she will not have a baby and her options for preventing or ending a pregnancy, the human right to parent the children she already has with the necessary social supports in safe environments and healthy communities without fear of violence from individuals or the government. And for us, that also includes impacting legislation. And then we added a piece at Sister Reach where we included those uh, from our LGBT community and those who need the right to express their, their spirituality and their sexuality uh, in a way that is not harming uh, just because of, of their culture or their, their sexual orientation. So definitely also including uh, that piece. And so the framework connects reproductive health and rights issues to other human rights concerns which impact women and girls, LGBT people and our families, to other health and human rights issues like economic justice, racism, environmental injustices, domestic violence, and as you've also heard today, police sanctioned violence, for example. And we define our common problem as reproductive oppression, which is the control and exploitation of women, girls, and individuals through our bodies, sexuality, labor, fertility, and reproduction in violation of our human rights. So in understanding that black women's wombs built in America and has been the constant contributor in the infrastructure on which America thrives and survives, it is the reasonable service of the White House, our legislators, and the medical community to center and save the lives of black mothers. Now what uh, black maternal health looks like in the state of Tennessee uh, includes uh, House Bill 1660, though uh, Sister Reach and our partners were able to defeat it, which were, 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 was criminalizing mothers uh, for using opiates. Uh, and so that also has now kind of grown into what we see as coercive birth control practices. Uh, after the defeat of that legislation. Uh, right now, I think just recently we read that over 90 uh, jails are doing a long after reversible contraception program with inmates. And so what's happening now, right, is that black mothers, mothers in general, that includes white rural mothers in communities like in East Tennessee, where we initially saw this problem, uh, are now being basically uh, voluntarily uh, offered long after reversible contraception so that they can, so that their population can be controlled, so they can have babies. So, um, so Tennessee making LARC available or long after reversible contraception available to low income women, teens and undocumented women now, I guess as their response to trying to curtail teen pregnancy issues, uh, unplanned pregnancy, um, and instead of expanding uh, comprehensive sexuality education and making health care available to all Tennesseans is now uh, what they're thinking is the better choice. Uh, and so let's look at a couple of instances in, in, uh, in Tennessee, including the case of Anna Yoka, which was a white woman who uh, did a self-abortion or tried to self-abort last year by using a coat hanger. Now, though we're not here to necessarily talk about Anna Yoka, we are here to talk about black mothers, what this looks like is that uh, this is the culture that Republicans have created. Okay, and I just think that I want to you know, make sure that we lift that up, that for every anti-abortion restriction that we have, it forces mothers, it forces us to make health care decisions, including abortion, when we might want to bring a, a pregnancy to term. And more women will self-abort as abortion restrictions increase. Black mothers in particular are making decisions to have abortions because we cannot afford to expand our families. We do not understand our bodies. We cannot educate our children, and yet we are expected uh, you know, to, to be what, what uh, America is wanting to be, a better asset without being given the tools. 
disparities facing youth and, long, and LGBT mothers is also something that we're not talking about in the context of black mothers, including masculine or central women of color who are mothers. Trans men who are mothers have been absolutely left out of the narrative when we start talking about reproductive health care and maternal health care. This also includes our teens, where we're focusing on unplanned pregnancy or teen pregnancy prevention instead of expanding comprehensive sexuality education and contraception access, not just uh, in the medical community, but even on school campuses. Young people need access to condoms. Young people need access to cop sex ed, which is the uh, scientifically accurate uh, uh, and, and effective way to make sure that we you know, don't have babies before we want to have our children. So we place teen pregnancy prevention over sexually transmitted infection and HIV prevention, over healthy relationships, advocacy, and continue to lead teen boys out of this dynamic. The White House is irresponsible for gutting cop sex ed. Uh, and the funding that, and instead trying to reallocate those funds to ineffective, medically inaccurate, abstinence-only uh, programs. So the geographical disparities that we're facing in Tennessee, and this includes our urban communities as well as our rural communities, and then when we start thinking about what that looks like in our Midwestern communities as well as our Northern communities, black mothers are losing all over this country. Uh, black mothers have been abandoned by America, though we are the mule of America, the scapegoat of America. Among these geographies, our disparities uh, similar, uh, are similar with access being the determining factor to how dire our disparities are, as you've heard my distinguished colleagues uh, say today. So recommendations for legislative accountability include connecting your work to black women-led organizations like Sister Reach that are on the ground working on behalf of our communities, in touch with women every day, able to be able to give information to you to make sure that you can properly advocate for us here on the Hill. Uh, to apply funding for midwifery and doula care services, not just for this, what, you know, what we're calling this kind of gentrification of midwifery that we're seeing white women need, but I'm talking about the, the, the culture of midwifery that has begun since Africa. Right. Okay. This is ingrained. This is the way that we've been taking care of our families the entire time. And we need our legislators to get behind black mothers, get behind black midwives, get behind black doulas to make sure that our health care is fair to change. And then we need to apply that work on the, uh, the state and the federal level, not just, and, and even on the local level. Okay, and then make sure that we expand Medicaid so that the people, uh, so that the people who are most vulnerable are centered versus those who have the, the means that is most convenient for to access health care. So that last recommendation includes ensuring that the current health care bill does not leave out prenatal and postnatal care among other huge areas that are already being left out. That preventative and postnatal care is where mother and baby are most vulnerable. And we've already seen success in this in Tennessee. You know, in the last five or six years, we've seen those rates absolutely turn around because there was legislative support, there was funding support on the local, state, and the national level. And then, last but not least, uh, black mothers are showing up at the polls. All right? We just showed up 94%, right, in this last election. So we've shown by our leadership, by our labor, by our wounds and by our votes that we are showing up for America. And so now it's time for America to show up for our moms. Hey, it's good to see you all, friends. I've been in this room a lot, and I've never seen it like this. So, uh, praise the Lord. It's been a good day today. So thank you for the work that you do and the conversations that you're having. Uh, let me tell you, I wear red on Wednesdays. It's about bringing the girls back from Boba Haram. Mm -hmm. And some of us wear black flowers on our red because we're black women. Yeah. And we work in various spaces and have various issues. And one of the issues that we have that's vitally important is all about the um, impact of decisions on our health care and our ability to have a healthy baby, to raise a healthy child, and to ensure that we have healthy communities. So very, very a uh, couple days ago, I did this um, few moments on the floor about racism and discrimination in this country. And I entitled my talking point from the cradle to grave. Yeah. And talked about the disparities affecting black women, black children, black girls, black men, black young people, black old people, black working people, black trying people get an education. Yeah. 
from the cradle to the grave. And so obviously this is a very important point that we are dealing with in, in this discussion because we're talking about the baby in the beginning. And we're talking about ensuring that mothers have a kind of health care access so that they can bring healthy babies into the world. So we know what's going on in the Senate, or we don't know what's going on. <laughs> what we know is nothing good is going on in the Senate at this moment as they're raising health care bill. So we do what we can when we can. Good to see you. Please stay alert, awake, energized, and ready to mobilize. Because our voices must be heard. And the one thing I hear about over there in the Senate, I think as Ms. McConnell said, no one's calling us on the phone. Well, let's do something about that. Yeah. Literally. But I uh, reintroduced a bill that I had introduced when I first got here. It's called the Healthy Moms Act. And what it simply does is say that a woman finding that she is pregnant should be, should be eligible to get health care, health insurance at that time. Not wait until the baby is born, but that time. So that she can have the kind of vitamins and nutrients and guidance and, and concern and care and doctor's appointments that she needs to have a healthy pregnancy, which will in turn hopefully have a healthy baby. And those are the kinds of things that we will continue to fight, collectively and individually. Having you here on this hill, on this floor, in this office, at this time, just right next door to my office, is an absolute blessing and an affirmation that what we do, we do for one another. As black women, we know that we're never on this journey alone. We're standing beside, sometimes in front of us, sometimes behind the partners we have, but we're always protecting the children that God blesses us with in one way, shape, or form. So thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here, and thank you for doing what you do. God bless. I had to make sure that everything was okay, but it was timely because I hope you are listening to this gentleman and what he said, you have got to keep the pressure on. You really are the wing, the wind beneath our wings. I mean, we can come here and talk, but we need the pressure from the public. And frankly, um, we, we just got some news today that there's a really good chance that the Senate is going to pass that bill. Oh, yeah. And um, there's a very good chance, and it will be a big cut, the biggest cut uh, in Medicaid. It hasn't passed yet. We're going to try to do everything we can do in these next two weeks. But it looks like it, they may have a really good chance. They only need 50 votes because Pence will come in and be 51. So we need you to be loud and clear as far as health care. I mean, it's just so important, and you're so important, so I'm glad you're gathered today, but so I, that's why I ran up, because I just want to support what you said and let them know that you vote. I'm with you, whoever in my district. <laughs> but um, it's just so important to be active and to be, whether you email, write, call, fax, whatever, go to town hall meetings, uh, whatever you want to do, all of it is definitely effective. But I just want to say hi and stop by and make sure everything was okay, and thank you for what you Thank did. you. Thank you about the Affordable Care Act, which is, as was mentioned by the Congresswoman, the Senate is currently considering its own repeal bill. Mm -hmm. So maternity benefits, maternity coverage is one of the pieces that would be taken out. It would be optional for states. On top of budget cuts to Medicaid, not just Medicaid expansion, but Medicaid mm -hmm. yeah. uh, itself, uh, as well as excluding Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. from Medicaid funding as well. So what is your advice or recommendation uh, to those of us who are working here in D.C., which can sometimes be so insular and the information is not always translated in digestible ways, what are your recommendations for getting information out to folks and getting folks engaged uh, about what's at stake? Because I was just, I've been on the Hill every week since I've been president of ACOS. Last week we were here for contraception. Uh, the week before we was here with the uh, presidents of all the other societies, including the pediatricians and the psychiatrists and so forth, but we met with the senators, we met with their aides, and we're, uh, we're trying to, again, we educate them, but data doesn't really matter. Uh, you mm -hmm. got to have, the Medicaid is actually a success story, right, right. if you think about the data. Uh, so we have to begin to kind of frame this up. When I said that we were here representing 560,000 physicians and millions of people who need health care and who vote, 
I think that's what gets people's attention. And also it helps them to understand that. It may not change uh, that many votes, but the other thing that we've done is said, you know, if you believe like we believe, grab one of those congressional colleagues by the hand and say, don't buckle. Focus on what the real issues are. Don't buckle. Don't buckle under the political pressure. And by having gone to those town hall meetings, and also having our OBGYNs and everybody else write an op-ed in your local newspaper about affordable contraception, about these type of things, is the way to get it done. All politics is local. And that's it. Put it in the news. That's the key. And today. I wanted to ask if there are any efforts by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance to organize at the state and district level around this issue. Um, as I hear the presentations today, I keep thinking there needs to be a campaign if there's not already one started. So we'd love to hear that if you have strategies. And I think that's going to be really important also as we're looking at 2018 and 2020 as well. <laughs> um, so um, the steering committee members, we have um, five of the I'm Kwajalyn Jackson. I'm the Community Education and Advocacy Director at Feminist Women's Health Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And on the Black Mamas Matter Alliance Steering Committee, I'm the Outreach and Engagement Chair. Next we have Elizabeth Dawsgay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Elizabeth Dawsgay, and I'm Chair of the Steering Committee of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Monica Simpson. I'm the Executive Director of Sister Song with the National Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. And I'm also a steering committee member, and I chair of the communications side of that work. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela Donisola Aina. Um, I'm a public health um, researcher and scientist, and also I am the program chair for the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And as programming chair, <laughs> um, to answer the question that was raised before, we do have opportunities for folks to join our alliance on different levels. We have an opportunity for you to become a collaborator where we can further discuss um, opportunities for local and state level campaigns and initiatives on a multitude of the issues that were brought up today. Um, we also have an opportunity for everyone to join our general mailing list um, please do visit our website at blackmamasmatter.org um, today. <laughs> and also, before you leave, make sure you pick up some um, good giveaways. We have some left. And then, you know, um, contact any one of us on the steering, steering committee. Um, and we have some business cards um, available for you to follow up with us on. And thank you. And, you know, this is all from that delivery. So our strategies including culture shifts, um, changing research, uh, advancing um, quality care, um, policy, part of this, like having a field briefing, and then I don't know if we're going to That's it? Okay, good. Come on. Yeah. 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 I'm the uh, board chair of Physicians for Reproductive Health. It's a physician-led advocacy and uh, uh, organization. Uh, and I'm also a board certified OBGYN, so I'm elated at the leadership of Dr. Haywood Brown of our organization that prioritize women's health. Uh, one of the arms of Black Mamas Matter is uh, uh, research. And so I have a question um, and, and possibly a research uh, agenda item. Um, as, a, as an abortion provider, uh, and one of the things we know that in order for maternal mortality to occur, you have to be pregnant, right? So when, when abortion access disappears, we have women who are being forced to continue pregnancy to assume that risk, no matter what their reproductive intentions are. My question is, has anyone sought to correlate the disappearance of abortion access to the rising maternal mortality? Uh, and if they haven't, then maybe a consideration is to, uh, to correlate because cause and effect is hard to prove. Sometimes the best we can do is uh, establish a strong correlation. So as we watch abortion access disappear, we watch maternal mortality rise, maybe we should be looking at 
the correlation between maternal mortality and decreased access to abortion care because when abortion care access disappears, it becomes a determinant of maternal mortality. Who is say OBGYN will be there for that. But since the access has been limited in Texas, I can tell you that first of all, the pregnancy rate has run, uh, and also that we're beginning to get that first uh, set of data on maternal morbidity and mortality. And so uh, I think you're absolutely right. Access to contraception, access to uh, abortion, affordable contraception, which by the way, Richard Nixon signed into law with Title 10. Okay? Uh, so these are the, I think you're absolutely right. We will have that data. And this is data the CDC is always monitored. I think we'll be able to see it more graphically. But I also want us to kind of like dig into this, this notion of like, you know, contraception, abortion, you know, all of that, making sure that we have access to that so that also that then starts to lower the numbers. But I want us to think about What's important to us in the Black Moms Matter Alliance is like this intersectional approach for us to really understand that when we talk about contraception sometimes, if we put that out there very explicitly and then don't undergird that in, a, in an analysis around the fact that, oh, that will just open up more opportunities for people to just push marks and to push things like that on our communities that's already like showing up in ways that's not, you know, really thinking about the fullness of what our communities need. So that's one of the things that we work to do with our research and what we're working to do to with our different partners is to say yes to all of that and to keep in mind that when we talk about contraception, we're not only talking about one particular type of contraception, but that there is a full menu of options for folks and that we keep all of those options on the table for what's going to be best for our community. So just to kind of give you all an idea of how we look at research, how we look at data, and how we're then putting that into context with the lived experiences of black women um, and black communities, right? It, it's really important for us. We recognize that the United States love giving things, right? So we're going to fix it and we'll tell you the baby box. We're going to fix the <laughs> uh, with breastfeeding with breast pumps. We're going to fix um, unintended pregnancy with larks and all of the things. We don't really think that we're going to people. We want to give people things without changing people's literal experiences with their actual community. Until we really reframe that as a country, we're going to keep having that thing. And so we fundamentally understand that as an alliance. And so whatever we do is going to be grounded with that understanding. Um, and you know, we are really running out of time. Um, <laughs> and this one, I don't know, I mean. I don't want the men to be forgotten. Let me just say this to you. Black mothers are raising black sons. That's right. Okay? And I teach a male responsibility program. I do a boot camp for fathers to educate them on pregnancy and pregnancy complications and so they can understand it better. Because, again, it takes two to make a baby, even if you make it in a test tube. So I want people to understand that this is not just a one-person deal. It is a two-person deal. We have shown that when men understand the importance of breastfeeding, that their patients are more, their, their, their partners are more likely to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. That's key. When they understand the ramification of smoking, they're less likely to smoke in the home. And when they understand the risk factors for prematurity, they are more likely to make sure that that partner gets in the next time to get on the appropriate medication for it. And so I can tell you that it, it does matter whether they are black, brown, educated, uneducated, engage them, they want to be involved. And that's something that's very important. And keep in mind, I was raised by my mother and father, but the men do that. Thank you. I wasn't asking for that. But I partners and supporters and even if it's just moral support, right? Like we really need, because this is a movement. We are building a campaign. This is a, a multi-layered, a huge alliance that we're putting together with the help of all of you. We will be back over and over again on this hill doing the same work. We want this room to get more and more packed. We want people to be able to not to get inside because this is an important issue and we need all y'all to come help us to keep this going. Thank you, Professor. Oh, is this boys going around? Please sign up.